All right, hey everyone, welcome to the newest episode of Heal Thyself. This is number 23. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for supporting, for rating, reviewing, subscribing. This show is growing because you all have been actively supporting it, telling your friends, telling your family. I really appreciate the power of you and the power of social media and the power of empowerment. Uh, thank you so much. We have a really good show. Uh, I'm gonna do some good teaching points about some important stuff. Oh man, we're gonna review a really good product out here, the hot, one of the hottest products in the health food industry. And we have a really good guest, a, a friend of mine who's gonna be really teaching us some stuff that maybe we don't know and how to deal with things that maybe we don't need to know we are dealing with. Who knows, we'll dive in. Let's jump in right into our knowledge bomb. All right, why? Isn't anyone talking or focusing on the lymphatic system? The lymphatic system, what the heck is that? Well, we learn about it. We learn about it in school. We learn about it in med school for sure. Um, but we don't really have a good grip on it. We don't really understand the complexities and we're still learning about it, right? So it's not something that even all the functional doctors, all the naturopathic doctors, all the alternative doctors, focus on, but it should be, because there's some really important points into this whole system that we need to pay attention to. All right, so like I mentioned, we're still learning about the lymphatic system, where it fully travels, we're figuring out different parts of the body we didn't even know were there. Um, but what it is, is basically our own sewage system. Right, you have you you know how remember when you were in school and there was a poster and you saw how the blood vessels travel across the body and you're like wow that's a really crazy network huh? Well, very similar. We we have the lymphatic system, which is a system like that that travels. It's a network throughout the body, right? It's a, it's a basically a roadway, just like the vascular system. Only this is a little different. Right? So you have a series of tissues and organs also working with this, like the vascular system. But uh, what happens is that this is more of, as I mentioned, a sewage system, sewage. Right? So think about your community and you have an old whole underground sewage system. It's like that, right? It's supposed to clean out our body. It has very particular functions, which I'm gonna go into, but we need to pay close attention to how we optimize this. Because if this is sluggish and this ain't working, you better believe that's gonna manifest in your body. So some of the organs associated with the lymphatic system are tonsils, adenoids, spleen, thymus, appendix. We have these patches, even our intestines, that are closely associated. So these are also key players in our immune system. So you have to understand, if this sewage system is backed up, it ain't functioning right, our immune system is gonna to suffer too. So it's not only detoxifying, getting, getting rid of crap in our body, but it's also the function of our immunity. Now, I just mentioned some of the organs, which is I'm always reluctant to hear when a kid is, has to take, off their, take out their tonsils or adenoids um, instead of really addressing why they're growing, right? Because if you address why they're growing oversized or enlarged, then you remove that, optimize the child, because it's using children, then you don't have to take the tonsils out. I'm very reluctant for any surgeries, to be honest, unless it's really absolutely necessary. So if your doctor's saying, okay, well, their tonsils have been growing for the past four months and there's a lot of issues and they're not going down, let's just remove them. You gotta remember, every organ has a very particular function, even if we don't understand it fully. So uh, what happens is this fluid, this lymph begins, uh, it comes out of the blood vessels, the capillaries, and we have proteins, minerals, nutrients, substances. This is traveling and providing nutrients to these tissues, but guess what it's really doing? It's taking these damaged cells, these cancer cells, foreign particles like bacteria, viruses, uh, that have made enter the tissue and it drains them out, it cleans them out, right? It brings them to these lymph nodes, which I'm gonna get into, that are strategically placed throughout the body, right? We have lymph nodes. Do you know, how about when you're sick? You ever feel your neck and you go, what is this? This is growing? What is it? This is a little thing that I have. Oh my God, I must be sick. Well, that's your lymph nodes. You have lymph nodes in your neck, you have them under your arms, you have them in your pelvis, they're really concentrated there. That's superficially, but they're also really deep. They're, all, they're around some of the organs. So 
uh, these glands are checkpoints, right? They take these filtered or uh, they filter these cancer cells, the foreign particles, these damaged cells. They have white blood cells that help fight and eat up all of these bugs that are traveling, right? So they're immunity checkpoints, you can think about that. So you know that when you're sick, right, and you're feeling on your neck or your collarbone and you have a swollen lymph node, that means your infection is being cleared and your body's working to clear it, right? So uh, that's why they swell, right? There's, there's a recruitment of more and more white blood cells to start killing up these bugs. So really impressive stuff, such intelligent design in the body, but these lymph nodes can also swell because of inflammation, because of cancer. So when I tell people, women in particular, to do breast exams, you have to check your breast, check your breast tissue, make sure you're going around the borders, collarbone, under, all the way to the sternum, but always check under your arm, always. Because remember I said, it's not just infection, it's inflammation and, and cancer too. So when you do your breast check monthly, which every woman listening to the show should pick a day and do, then make sure you're checking under your arms too, okay? So this system needs to run smoothly, as you can imagine. You don't want your town's sewage system to be backed up because you're gonna suffer. What happens is when this is backed up, here are some manifestations. You have a blockage, right? And then you have something called lymphedema. You usually see this in folks who get uh, infections or traumas or surgeries, for example, in breast cancer, when they get lymph nodes removed. I don't, many of you may have, may or may not have seen uh, when uh, the individual's arm starts swelling up, and that's because there is a blockage into that sewer system, right? So really important. Anyone who has a trauma or a surgery or infection and is experiencing that swelling to be sure to always do exercise and yoga. There's good data out there, especially the power of exercise and yoga to help reduce that swelling. I have a patient who has kept her swelling under control since her surgery just by doing exercise and yoga. It's pretty impressive stuff. So what else swells it up? Infections. You, you, as I mentioned, swollen lymph nodes, but cancers too. You ever hear of lymphoma? That's where, it's, that's where it's coming from, all right? That's where it's attacking that system. So how do we know our lymphatic system is sluggish? As I remember, remember I said that your sewage system of your community, how do you know that your body sewage system is sluggish? Well, what happens is you start getting persistent infections. You're always gonna have those swollen lymph nodes, so your body's continuously fighting and fighting and fighting. Fatigue, inflammation, sluggishness, puffiness, headaches, brain fog. I mean, all of these really generalized symptoms that could be something completely different, right? You could be, you could be hypothyroid, for example. But still, pay attention if you're continuously and chronically feeling these generalized uh, symptoms that are reducing your, val your value, your way of life, right? Your quality of life. The more chronically ill you are, the more that you're gonna be experiencing these symptoms, right? So if you're continuously puffy and inflamed and sluggish and fatigued, having headaches and brain fog, it might be something that you need to pay close attention to when it comes to your lymphatic system, all right? How the heck do you support the lymphatic system? All right, remember, this show is educational. I'm not here to give medical advice. That's my other profession as a doctor. So uh, I, I won't be prescribing any herbs, uh, prescribing any nutraceuticals. I will mention, but always, as a disclaimer, talk to your practitioner before you do anything on the show because I can't have responsibility for something that happens, right? You gotta ask your practitioner to make sure that it is safe and effective. All right, with that said, how do you support it? Number one is movement, why? Because like the vascular system, it doesn't have pumps. The lymphatic system is stimulated and moved by movement, exercise, right? Exercise, exercise, exercise. So just literally walking, the compression of your muscles is starting to move that lymphatic fluid, walking exercising, running, sprinting, I don't care what you do, but movement always should be in the forefront of your mind. And this is just basic, basic core fundamental health stuff, okay? Breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing, that facilitates movement of the lymph. So if you're sitting at home, you ain't moving. If you're sitting at home and you ain't breathing, you better believe your lymphatic system is becoming backed up, stagnant, and clogged up. So make sure alongside movement, you practice, do it now. You practice deep breathing. Breathe in, hold, and then breathe out, right? Put your body in a parasympathetic mode. Do that 10 times. Know that if you're taking deep inhalations, deep, uh, deep exhalations, you're stimulating your diaphragm to start moving that lymphatic, lymphatic fluid. What intelligent design we have, right? Just literally breathing is helping detoxify us. 
pretty crazy stuff. What else? Man, hydration. 95% of lymphatic fluid is water. You need to be drinking water, at least half your body weight in pure, clean, filtered water. I'm going to do a whole water show. You better believe it. But pay close attention to the water you're drinking. If you're drinking plastic water, you're already feeding your body some very potent toxins. Don't be drinking from plastic bottles. You already know. I hope at this point it's common knowledge. Get yourself a high quality quality water filter, which I do talk about throughout social media. Um, I do vouch for many other companies that do really good quality water filtration. All right. So always keep hydrated. This is, again, basic stuff, but now you have reasoning, right? You understand why conceptually this is helping you. All right. What else? Environmental personal care products. I mean, I love environmental medicine. This stuff can be very toxic. We know that it's not directly going straight into the lymphatic system, it's being detoxified in the liver, but understand too that this stuff is immunotoxic, right? So it's affecting your immune system. And if it is affecting your immune system, then theoretically, that's backing up your lymphatic system. It's such that your lymphatic system is not working to its highest capacity, right? What else affects it? Oxidative stress. Well, these sort of uh, agents, right, that we see in environmental toxins, air quality, right, not having a good water, uh, air filter, uh, personal care products, really crappy, like Old Spice, head and shoulders, uh, all of that stuff that we're putting in our body, nail polish, that stuff, again, as I said, is immunotoxic, but it also causes oxidative stress to the system. So this is the importance of plant-based antioxidants. Man, I am going in circles all the time in every show for a reason, because I am building the fundamentals and helping you all. Plant-based antioxidants have phytonutrients that help negate the oxidation that you're getting throughout life. That is strengthening and supporting your lymphatic system. Very important. What else? Dry brushing. I do that. I do dry brushing in the morning. You have a, a, a dry brush. You can get it online for like four or five bucks. And you, you, you run this brush across your body or through your body. Uh, and making sure that it is all going towards your heart, right? Because that is pretty much right, at, right under your collarbone is where all of this lymphatic fluid is draining into the heart. So make sure that you're all, all, wherever in your body you're running the brush is aiming towards your heart. And don't do it too hard, right? You wanna do it nice and softly. Dry brushing is awesome. I've seen people actually reduce swelling in their limbs from dry brushing, just dry brushing. So it's powerful, it's therapeutic. Yeah, and everyone should be doing it as part of their morning routine. It's part of my morning routine. Before I get in the shower, I do it. Digestion. You ha I mean, I feel like I don't care if it's lymphatic system, uh, your, your venous system. I don't care if it's your endocrine system, nervous system. Everything is really coming back to the digestive health. If your digestion is shitty, you better believe your lymphatic system is going to be shitty. And they're closely related, right? Because when you ingest fats or fat-soluble vitamins... They are coming into contact with the villi, and the villi is sucking them up and bringing them to, into the lymphatic system. And that's part of what the lymphatic system's function is. So what affects these villi, these finger-like projections? Celiac disease, SIBO, some medications, Crohn's disease, digestive infections, food intolerances. So this is why it's important to, if you have no other idea how to work on your health, no other idea, you're not getting direction from your doctor, you're not getting direction from your acupuncturist, from your psychotherapist, where, if Google, whatever you're choosing to look, focus on your digestive system. If, if you have nowhere to go, first focus on your digestive system and then go from there. All right. Rebounder. Some people actually have these little trampolines that they go in the morning and they jump for maybe 10, 15 minutes. But actually that does help stimulate that lymphatic movement, right? You can do that instead of dry brushing or you can dry brush or you can do both, whatever. And there are herbs that have been shown to support, uh, cleanse uh, the lymphatic system, um, but I'm not going to talk about them. You know, talk about that with your doctor, okay? Uh, or look online and then talk about it with your doctor. But um, yeah, there are some that, that do help support it. So look, this is basic stuff, right? But the importance of the lymphatic system, we don't even know completely. It's not stressed. We learn about it in medical school, but not the way we do other stuff. It's sort of a mystery. We're still learning about it. So why not take these very, very simple interventions, right? Like exercise, breathing, plant-based foods, antioxidants, right? Dry skin brushing, rebounder, optimizing your digestive system. Why not take these things 
and just implement them to know you're doing right by your sewage system. All right. So very easy stuff. I hope you all took something home from this. And um, yeah, I'm glad to be disseminating this stuff. Much love to you on this. All right, check this out. We're going into our product review and I could not wait to do this one. I was up late doing some research. I called some companies in the morning and let's go right into it. Product review. All right, today's Today's, today's review is going to be on oat milk. This has to be the hottest alternative milk. And, and you know what? In many ways, I'm proud that uh, there are now more options away from dairy. I really don't know why dairy is even still in existence because oats are booming right now. This oat milk craze is booming. And it's been for like maybe two years especially last year, there was actually a $1.1 billion drop in 2018 for dairy, right? For milk versus the year before. And in 2018, nut milks went up by $1.6 billion. Okay, so over the last five years, non-dairy grew by 61%. And now the dairy industry is fighting feverishly to, for even these companies to take out the word milk, right? So they have a monopoly over the word milk. Uh, because they're losing so much money. My theory is that people are just becoming smarter and more informed and knowing that dairy can be destructive to health from right after breastfeeding all the way to elder. It destroys the body. It's crap. It's not made for us. Nature certainly didn't intend for us to be drinking another species milk. It's one of the most unnatural acts that I can think of. It's pretty crazy that we do every single day. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm behind plant milk and alternative milks, but I also want them to be good quality. I also want them to be nutritious, right? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So last year, particularly the, the most popular one is the Oatly oat milk and their demand just boomed to the point where there was actually a shortage of Oatly oat milk. This is out of Sweden. So they rose uh, last year 52% and uh, almond milk rose by 11%, and all plant milk growth was about 9%. Um, but, but what we see is that there's a craze for it, and it's really because it's thicker, it's smoother, and people love adding it to coffee, and people love coffee, I did a whole show on that, right? But I wanna speak about quality, right? Because if you're drinking oat milk, particularly every single day, we need to find out which one is the best one out there. So like always, I start with the really, really crappy one, and then go from there, right? After Oatly started booming, other big companies like Pepsi and this one, Quaker Oat Beverage, Quaker Oat Beverage, jumped in on the money train. Man, I've never been a fan of Quaker, to be honest. I used to eat it when I wasn't informed, but what happened is that Quaker jumped in on it, and now they're making oat milk, and Look, when you look at nutritionally, not super high in carbs compared to the others, definitely not as high in sugar, right? So nutrition fact-wise, right? We're looking at macronutrients for all you macronutrient fiends. It, it, it's not that bad, but you gotta think about quality. And we know Quaker is some of the worst quality oats out there. Why? Because Quaker don't give a damn about your health. They will spray their oats with glyphosate as a drying agent. Do you remember how many times I've spoke about glyphosate on this show, on Instagram? I don't even have a Twitter, but if I did, I would speak about it all the time on Twitter. You have to understand that glyphosate is not something that shouldn't be in our food system, that is by no means definitively safe. So uh, this is a company that uses glyphosate as a desiccant, a drying agent, and now we have it in concentrated milk. So basically what you're drinking is oat glyphosate beverage, super smooth. Uh, and and that, that ain't right, that's not right for me, right? It does have some added brown sugar, uh, sunflower oil, which is a little bit more inflammatory, it is more inflammatory than other oils. Um, and it has some gums fortified with some vitamins, but you know, the sourcing of the vitamins, you have no idea. It talks nothing about organic. It talks nothing about non-GMO. This shouldn't even be on our shelves, to be honest. Uh, actually, Quaker Oats shouldn't be on our shelves. It's probably the most famous one, but you know, it's the cheapest one, it's the worst quality one. So first and foremost, oat beverage, never, ever buy oat 
from Quaker. All right? No oat milk from Quaker. Let me go into this one. All right. Oatly. Oatly, Oatly, Oatly. Oatly, I want to be a huge supporter of. I want to because their marketing is great, right? It says, wow, no cow. Um, another uh, billboard that I saw, it says, it's like milk, but made for humans, which is actually a brilliant line. I love that and I can get behind that. But I want to inform you about a little something that they, that they do, and many of these companies do. <sighs> Oatly, uh, basically, it, it used to have on its cover, no added sugar, all right? But they can't have that anymore because their process of extracting uh, or making oat milk is like this. They take the oats, they take the water, and they add an enzyme to it. That enzymatic process, which occurs to create this oat milk, breaks down the oat starch. And what happens is simple sugars are created, primarily glucose and maltose. Now, when you look at the back of the Oatly Nutrition Facts, you will see that in one cup of oat milk, you get seven grams of sugar. Seven grams of sugar. But they do not need to add in that enzymatic process, the, the products that are made from that, the glucose and the maltose, in their nutrient facts in the back. So really what I'm trying to say is this. This has seven grams of sugar, but you ever notice that oat milk is a lot sweeter than seven grams of sugar? At this point, I think we should all be aware of what five grams of sugar tastes like, 21 grams of sugar tastes like. To me, it tastes like it's a lot more than that. Well, it is, because they don't need to disclose the amount of sugar that is really in oat milk. So you see seven grams, but it's not necessarily seven grams. So keep that in mind when you especially have Oatly oat milk and or many of these other oat milks, the same process, okay? So already, something to think about. And unfortunately, a lot of these companies remove the fiber, and I get it because it's insoluble and it would make the, the drink taste a, a, less palatable. But another thing that I don't like about oatmeal, Oatly uh, oat milk, is that we don't have an organic label. Now they say it, comes from 100% uh, organic oats, or it used to actually, this one doesn't say it. It used to come from 100% organic oats in Sweden, but you know, it, it didn't even have a label for organic oats in Sweden. Now it's telling me that it's non-GMO, and non-GMO on in the context of oats means that the oats aren't genetically modified, but they're not genetically modified food. But theoretically, they're not sprayed with glyphosate. I don't think that that's a guarantee. What is a better guarantee is a USDA organic label. Okay, doesn't have that. It has the non-GMO verified label, which causes a hell of confusion for so many people. And it has rapeseed oil, which I'm not a fan of at all because rapeseed oil is canola oil. Canola oil is a genetically modified food. So with the non-GMO verification, we know that the rapeseed oil is not genetically modified, but it does not guarantee that it is extracted and processed it is not extracted and processed with a solvent called hexane. Hexane is a nasty solvent, nasty one. It's very toxic. That's why canola oil in general is toxic, aside from its profile. It's just, it shouldn't be in the food system. So what, we, what I'm trying to say is this. Oatly oat milk, it has oats, no guarantee they're organic, no guarantee that they're not sprayed with glyphosate. It has rapeseed oil, why use any other oil, but it has canola oil, no guarantee that it's not um, used uh, or extracted with the solvent hexane. And then it's fortified with vitamins, which I do like, great. Um, but where's the sourcing? It's kind of hard to get in touch with them too, but where's the sourcing on this? Look, this is the most popular one by far, um, but you all, you all need to understand that we don't necessarily know how good quality is. It's a little ambiguous. I love what they're doing to move people away from milk, great marketing, but I wouldn't consider this a really healthy drink. Certainly not something that you should be drinking every single day and should be part of your diet, right? Don't go crazy with it. I mean, if you go to a, if you go to a coffee shop and they give you some and you say oat milk, what type you have, they have oatly, you can add it in there. You ain't gonna die, but just know that this should not be until oatly shows me USDA organic, until oatly removes canola oil, then I'll get behind it 100%. At this point, I'm not even behind it. All right, that's Oatly. So now you're like, oh, well, I love oat milk. What am I supposed to drink? To be honest, because I believe oat milk is in its infancy, there are not that many good options. 
I know you don't want to hear it, but there are not that many good options. Will there be this year, at the end of this year? Probably. Word on the street is Malk is making an oat milk. I know Malk makes high quality almond milk, so I'm hoping that they follow through on their oat milk with the USDA organic label, no canola oil. Oat milk should just be oats and water, and pretty much that's it. So the other ones that I have on here are, mm, same idea, right? This one's Planet Oak Oat Milk. It has a non-GMO label, you know, same exact thing, oat milk. And uh, it's probably, it's actually even a little bit better than uh, Oatly. It does have uh, natural vanilla flavor, not organic, natural flavors, not organic. So again, um, a little ambiguous. We don't know anything about the oats other than they're non-GMO, but guess what? Oats aren't a genetically modified food. So please, can someone tell me if these oats are being sprayed and dried with glyphosate? So really, I only found two pretty good ones uh, in my research. I didn't bring them on here, but I saw them on the internet. Thrive Organic Market has an oat milk that is just water and oats, and it's USDA organic. The other one is Pacific Foods. These are the two that I found that were organic, right? Thrive and Pacific Foods. The trade-off is that they have more sugar. 13 grams of sugar for the Thrive, 17 grams of sugar for Pacific. That's a lot of sugar in one shot. So if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have oat milk, probably the best bet would be to have, uh, let's say you have it in your coffee. You're not gonna have, be having a full cup unless you're having a cup of oat milk with a side of coffee, but you're not gonna be having a full cup. So I would actually go more with Pacific Foods or Thrive Market, because we know it's so important for me to know that the quality, right? We're not, there's no glyphosate in it, that it's not extracted with toxic solvents. I wanna know that the quality of my oats are better. And with that sacrifice is the sugar part. But, but it, again, it shouldn't be something that you're using every single day. You're not having two cups of it a day. Uh, Khalifa Farms makes another one. They say they have non-GMO, okay? Nice thing is it's gluten-free. Uh, oats are implicated a lot in cross-contamination. So if you have gluten, uh, gluten or celiac disease, gluten intolerance or celiac disease, then pay close attention to what oats, oats uh, milk you're getting. So here's a take home. You're shopping for oat milk. Here's what you gotta look for. One, know that the nutrition fact label of the sugars, it's probably higher than you see because uh, many of these companies use an enzymatic extraction that raises the amount of sugar inherently in the oat milk that they don't need to disclose. Avoid any ones with added flavors uh, or, not, or like, like, like a chocolate oat milk because that's already boosting up that sugar plus whatever's inherently in there. Um, know that most of these oat milks don't use the organic label, but certainly, certainly, certainly look for that organic label on your oat milk. It's really important. I do believe there'll be more this year, so, but let's stay tuned. Um, try to get ones that are just really oats and water. Um, the more simpler the ingredients, the better. There's a lot of gums and natural flavors that can be very ambiguous. Um, and glu gluten for cross-contamination. Make sure your oats aren't cross-contaminated. Make sure it says 100% gluten-free so you don't predispose yourself to any reactions. And at this point, yeah, like I said, use oat milk sparingly, especially with these companies that I mentioned. Um, there are, at this point, more established, better choices right now, like almond, hemp, coconut, and soy milks. Um, they have those organic and really clean ones out there. Um, I did a whole show on them, so you can check that in one of the earlier episodes. So that's the final verdict on oat milk. If I made any of you mad, I'm sorry. If I made any of you sad, I'm sad too. But look, the future is bright. Let's move to our special guest. All right, everyone, today's special guest, I'm so excited to have him on. It's a personal friend of mine. His name's Dom Forboni. He's a physical therapist. He just moved to LA from rural Minnesota, and he's going to drop some knowledge bomb. He's a super interesting guy, super knowledgeable guy. You're all going to learn a lot. Welcome to the show, Dom. Hey, thanks for the intro. Don't talk me up too much, but no, I think I can bring some good things to you guys. I today. had to talk you up a lot, man. You're, you're a good guy. You're a special guy. You got a lot to offer, so, you know, the world needs to know. Yeah, it's it's been a journey, and I, you know, that's what I like to say about everyone's life. Everyone's on their journey, and mine's really taking some turns lately. Yeah. You know, I've come out here to L.A., kind of pick up everything. I had my plans in Minnesota. I don't feel like I'm throwing those away or anything, but that's just the foundation, the understanding about what I want to do that yeah. now I can bring out here to LA that's much more wide open canvas than some of the places that I was working in rural Minnesota. I had a house in, in South Minneapolis. That's where all my family is. So 
kind of leaving my roots, taking taking the fruits out here to LA, and hopefully I can find a way to make it happen. Wow, that's a story right there. So how do you like LA? I love LA. Um, I've been here a total of like five days officially. I moved out about a month, month and a half ago, and um, did some traveling, and then now we're yeah, back living in Marina. I love it. Um, I'm not as used to the warmth, but I'm kind of near the beach, so it stays nice and cool, and mm-hmm. it's a little bit out of the center of L.A., so yeah. um, getting used to the city traffic. Even coming here, I'm like, it's not even bad traffic time. But yeah, no, I, I prefer not. I prefer the west side. So, you look, you were living in rural Minnesota, and I used to live in Minnesota. Yeah. I actually driven and hung out at times in rural Minnesota, and it's like a different world. Because yeah. I, I'm from New York, man, and it's like mm-hmm. I'm used to city and, and, and you know like the coast and the beach, and then you get there, and I was like, this is a different world. These are different. This is a completely different group of people that I've never experienced. Like, just the morals and values are completely different. Um, yeah. Can we? Can we? Like, what is it like out there? Well, there's a lot of blizzards in the winter. I drove yeah. through a lot more snow than I'm gonna see out here. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, the climate is one thing, but like you said, it's uh, the people. And the thing that I love, I love Minnesota people. Um, they call us icy nice. And when everyone talks about the winters, it's like, yeah, but in the winters, that's when you really start to learn your community. Yeah. So, you know, Minnesota is kind of a pretty tight knit community. You'll see people even in Minneapolis, even in the city who, yeah. when there's a bad snowstorm, people are out shoveling, pushing people's cars out that they don't even know. But they're I've like, seen hey. that. I've seen that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Living in Minnesota, you may have seen that. Yeah. A different environment, different type of community than you might see out here in New York, LA, but also very different understandings of some of the things that are a little bit more, you know, progressive out here and how we view health, how we view, how we treat our bodies, where we get our products. Um, you know, some of the stuff you talk about, how we source yeah. our products, the quality of what we're getting. And where I was working in rural Minnesota, I really started to learn kind of these different understandings of health that people had. Not good, bad, and different, but just how they understand health, how we get our health care uh, from the environment that they've lived in and grown up in. So mm-hmm. um, that was a great experience to be able to live in that for kind of my first year out of school after graduating um, and understand some of the things at large in this system that I think we need to work together as a health community to push forward. Yeah, I know you're really passionate about uh, community and raising the health of community and giving back, and that's wonderful and admirable. Can you tell me what is the access to healthy food or healthy knowledge where Mm -hmm. you were? Because a lot of people here, you know, listening to the show, not everyone's on the coasts. Right. Yeah. Big cities. Uh, there's a lot of people we're listening that live in the middle of North Dakota, you know. Yeah. So can you tell us about what your experience is with that and then maybe some ways that people can start becoming empowered to, to, to change this? Yeah. So I worked in a community called Marshall, Minnesota, and it was <laughs> a larger small community in the kind of southwest Minnesota. And so even living there and going to the grocery stores, um, you know, you don't see as large of an organic section as you do in something like a Whole Foods in the city or something. And and for me, I was lucky because I went to Minneapolis often and would usually just stop at a Whole Foods on the way out of Minneapolis. Yeah. But I think one of the big things is having that access to even the understanding and the knowledge and the things that you're putting out about all of the pesticides and crap and gunk that's getting thrown into our different foods and um how they're produced and, you know, even having your, your clean 15 dirty dozen lists Mm -hmm. that I've heard you talk Mm -hmm. about before. So having those types of understandings of just making sure that you can, even in that community, find the things that you can get that'll be a little bit higher quality, that'll treat your body a little bit better. Um, and also just even in the hospital, kind of the people that I worked with, I'm a physical therapist. I deal with people a lot about pain. People come in with pain. Yeah. You know, at some point in life, almost everybody has some sort of pain. And for me, it's helping people dice up and figure out where that's pain coming, that pain is coming from. Because often, if we got shoulder pain, we got back pain. If we've had it for more than six months, more than a year or beyond, or if it's something that kind of goes away, comes back, goes away, comes back, that pain might not actually be coming from your shoulder or your back, mm-hmm. which is a tough thing for some people to kind of wrap their head around. Mm-hmm. And we're never trying to tell people, oh, pain's up in your head, but our brain is the, ultimately the thing that perceives the pain yeah. and delivers it to us and, and gives us that perception of, ow, I'm hurting. Mm-hmm. 
And a lot of people that I had come to me have been had been spun through this 10, 15, 20 year path where they were still feeling the same issue, same pain, and oh, I had this doctor do this, I had this doctor give me this pill or this surgery, but then this started happening. And so what I started to realize in that experience is, what, what are we doing in this healthcare system here? This healthcare system that spends almost two times the next country per person on delivering the care, but our quality of life you know, compared to some developed Western European countries or Asian countries, and even our life expectancy can be quite a bit lower. Yeah. <laughs> so what's happening here? Where's all this money going? And that's where, again, I love some of the stuff you do where you point out how big industries kind of yeah. eke in their way into some of these areas. And for me, in hospitals, it's as a provider, how do we get to the root causes and how do we get to those underlying causes? So. That's something out here I know people are very open to, and how do we bring that understanding and knowledge to the smaller communities in yeah. rural Minnesota, North Dakota, that what we do and the actions we take have effect on how we feel and on our wellness and longevity and happiness and purpose later in life. So sorry, yeah. that's a long answer to yeah, no, what no, it was but it's like a, it's a good up. one. I, I love the story when you tell me that there, there'd be times where you didn't have access to high quality food yeah. So you just fast. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to fast because <laughs> I'm not going to eat because it's really shitty food. Right. So uh, w w what's up with that? What happened? Um, so sometimes I would be rushing out of the cities. And, you know, before I came out here, I was only working three days a week down in Marshall. I'd work Monday through Wednesday, long days. And, yeah, I didn't have time to pick up food. I'm like, you know what? I can make it these three days. Like, my body's got the fuel inside of it. And out in Minnesota, the thing that I had done for a lot of personal growth is I started listening to the podcast. I think that's a great way, you know, what we're doing now is a great access to information that you can get anywhere, yeah. whether it's on a library computer, your personal device, whatever you have that access to, I feel like everyone can get information this way. So I've started hearing people talking about fasting. I'm like, hey, I'll give this a try. Do it, did some intermittent fasting and then I did longer, you know, fast, about a 72 hour, three day fast yeah. is the longest I've done, but I've done that five, six, seven times because yeah. it feels so good for my body and just what it does to help me clear out some of the gunk, produce those, you know, endogenous ketones mm -hmm. that are going to help mobilize those fat sources yeah. and bring me the good energy, you know, help my brain because, you know, when our brain's running off the ketones and the fat sources, like you just feel so great. You're so, hyper focused. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really when I'm doing these fasts, people are like, you're crazy. You haven't eaten for 70 hours. I'm like, yeah. And I feel amazing. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, everyone should try a fast yeah, like People that. out there who haven't experimented with it, you know, there is a progression to getting up to a three day fast. Yeah. So if you try going for it right away, it might kind of shock your body. But, yeah. um, I'd encourage everyone to kind of explore that. Yeah. Yeah. And back to like access to good quality stuff. I mean, I, I've experienced that going through rural or just driving across country from uh, Jersey to Cali. Mm -hmm. uh, that drive, I mean, I, I, I had to go to gas stations and just find like granola bars to eat. Yeah. It was really crazy. And I was like, Jesus. And I'm what's like, in those granola bars is the next yeah, question. Yeah, exactly. What's in that? I'll do a whole show about those. <laughs> but, but, you know, understanding how spoiled we can be in these cities. So I think that there's uh, different delivery services now that can mm -hmm. really help these communities, right? I don't know if Thrive Market gets to those communities, but I think yeah. that that's an, that's, an, that's an option, right? But there's, there's plenty of them, you know? Yeah, and so there's I different mean, ones. I started using a service called Imperfect Produce or, yeah. you know, Crowd Cow is a great one if you eat meats or looking for different meat products mm -hmm. that you can literally see the family that raised the cow that right. sends you the meat. And so you kind of know right. where that source, where that quality is coming from. And they're starting to expand out to more communities in smaller areas or more rural areas. So... Um, again, they're generally the last places that start to get these services because they need to scale and get into bigger yeah. communities before they, they can do that. But it's a good thing to lurk, look for. Like you said, Thrive is huge and you can get fairly good and high quality products for a decent price. So. Yeah, that's, that's good stuff to hear. Now, you just spoke about pain a little bit. And I remember you told me a, a really impressive story about this man who was oh, yeah. basically, what was he, mobile? He, he was mm -hmm. in so much pain that he could hardly move. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about the power of what we can do with mind, body, breath, everything yeah. when it comes to pain and maybe even other things that we experience. 
Yeah, so I, and this story hit home a little bit because this man, rural Minnesota, he got in a snowmobile accident, right? He had broken collarbone and broken pelvis in about 50 different places. <laughs> I know, at, you know, fractures of some sort just all over his pelvis. And the occupational therapist was walking out of the room and I was walking in. She's like, good luck. I couldn't even get him to roll over in bed. He's mm -hmm. in so much pain and he's not taking pain meds. I'm like, oh, why is he not taking pain meds? And they said, well, he has history with drug abuse. Yeah. I mean, he used to be an addict and he keeps telling the nurses he doesn't want pain meds. And this, you know, gets into another talk about how we're in this opioid crisis mm -hmm. and people are continuing to use opioids. I just saw something come out that said for the first time it might actually reduce the number of overdose do doses or deaths from this year to last year. Um, but they're still kind of tabulating that. So that's exciting to see. We may actually be Making turning some, that around yeah. a little bit. But, you know, I had two uncles who passed away who struggled with drug and alcohol addiction mm -hmm. throughout their entire lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fairly direct causes of their deaths. Um, and this man just sat there and talked to me. He said, the nurses keep trying to push pain pills in my IV because they say I need to get moving and I'm in so much pain. And he said, you're a PT. I'm sorry, I'm not going to move with you. I said, that's all right, man. I just sit here and breathe because I got an idea. Mm -hmm. And I got in a real bad car accident and started doing breath work to overcome some of the pains and anxieties that I had after that car accident. Mm -hmm. And I kind of talked him through what we're going to do. We did some pretty intense breath rounds. If people know who Wim Hof is, I kind of modeled it after his just to help you dive deep into your ability to push your acid base blood buffer to one side of the scale to calm down your nervous system. It does a lot of things in our pain centers in our brain, which to get really sciencey, the paraaqueductal gray, it's kind of our own opioid center that has a descending pain inhibition pathway. And if you really dive deep into your breath work, you can start taking advantage of some of these things mm -hmm. that are a part of our autonomic nervous system, which, yeah, which throughout we, all of <laughs> yeah, we don't health control. history, we've been taught we don't control this. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, so I, I did some breath set, sets with him, and I sat there, and after the first round, I'm like, how do you feel? Because I always kind of, like, yeah. love to see people's realization once yeah. they do some breath work, and then they get into their body a little bit, and he's like, I don't feel my pelvis right now. <laughs> and he, like, almost whispered it to me because he was in so much pain just before yeah. that, and I'm like, want to try moving? Yeah. He's like, yeah. yeah. And so we, you know, once he started moving, then boom, he consciously snaps back to the pain he's feeling. Sure. So then I say, all right, let's do some breathing while we're doing it. We moved, sat to the edge of the bed, did another breath set while he was sitting and then stood him up and just had him like lightly try to march his heels up and down. And then that's all we got done that day. But it empowered him to find that ability within himself. Yeah. And for me, all and I try not to be frustrated at providers specifically because I think I've learned that we more so live in a system that pushes these quick fixes of medicine that mm -hmm. only gives us three minutes to be in a room with a patient at a time. What else are we going to do other than write them a prescription? Yeah. Especially when that's what's reimbursed for. Are yeah. we going to tell them to go to a wellness session or a holistic you yeah. know, person that costs hundreds of dollars? Yeah. That's a real tough thing to push on somebody when you know they want the quick fix, they want their pain gone now. So again, a little bit of long story, but I love that you brought that up because that's one patient that I'll take with me forever mm -hmm. um, as an experience that showed me the power of breath that I could bring somebody and it's something he did independently. Yeah. And it speaks to my purpose. I love heal thyself because my one sentence why statement is to empower the individual to find independence in their journey. Mm -hmm. And we just need to help providers learn how to do that so we don't require them to come back in every three, six months. Right. Yeah. The dependency part is is part of the system, right? Yeah. The, the loss of prevention is the part of the system, mm -hmm. right? So the construct of this paradigm is such that even the most well-meaning providers mm -hmm. are still stuck in a system. Yeah. You can only go so far. You hit a ceiling and then you're like... Well, shit, this wasn't what I signed up for. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I've met, a, I've met a lot of unhappy doctors because they're mm -hmm. like, I could be doing more. And then they're, there's a light and spark in them when they say, oh, my God, why don't I just move into this either functional paradigm or naturopathic mm -hmm. paradigm? Because then they're becoming empowered to know I can take more time with these patients. You know, most yeah. of the time insurance won't reimburse because that's part of the system. Yeah. But 
this is this is serving their life purpose for healing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I and I love what you did with this patient because now, let's say he's home and he's still hurting a little bit, yeah. he still can breathe. You gave him tools, and that's what the empowerment is: giving these people tools. Yeah. So breath work has served him well. What about you? You mentioned you got into an accident. You got you had some anxieties. How can people who are listening learn what they can do with this Wim Hof breathing. What is Wim Hof breathing in, in any way? So Wim Hof is this really cool, interesting. Uh, it's a documentary. Guy. Yeah, it's a, there's a documentary on him. Um, there's all sorts of videos on YouTube. If you go to the Wim Hof Method .com, you can figure out anything about his techniques. He's got a free app now too, but he basically created this breath technique. And he doesn't even take credit for it. He's like, I didn't create it. I sell air and ice. Yeah. <laughs> like, because his thing is breath technique, ice training, and mindfulness, consciousness about the body as yeah. you're doing these things. Yeah. And his thing is you can completely tap into all these autonomic processes. You mm -hmm. can, I mean, he's been on record with 12 people that he trained for four days. They've been able to suppress endotoxins that get put into their blood that are supposed to, you know, cause like fever and diarrhea and they just breathe on through it. And it, what they've done on the blood test is that they've upregulated their T regulatory cells, which are your natural killers. So in your immune system, you have all these T cells that are like waiting for something new to pop mm -hmm. into the system. And then they latch onto it, figure out how to kill it and take care of it. And if I got the science wrong, you can correct me on that. <laughs> I just did a whole show on the lymphatic system. So oh, yeah. we talked a little bit about immune cells too. So yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he, he's like, you can upregulate your T cells. You can improve your lymphatics. Every time yeah. we breathe and pump, yeah. we're pumping all these about that, yeah. huge lymphatics in our groin, yeah. under our ribs, yeah. in our you know shoulders. So, um, yeah, that's the breath work is a big part of his thing. And for me, what it helped me do is calm my mind. I had never been able to meditate or whatever people consider meditation before I got into this breath technique. And I started having these experiences where I would just do one of these techniques and you almost wake up from it because you're able to calm and shut off your mind so much to the point that you lose this perception of time and space and you can just sit in this peace for a while. And yeah, I was having different you know, kind of night terrors or just anxieties that would come up about the accident I had and it would make my neck pain, you know, worse from the whiplash from the mm -hmm. accident. And I was having some different post-concussive symptoms for about six to eight months after that. And it was the breath work that really just helped me. Even in the middle of the day, I would do my three breath, breath reset where I would just, you know, deep breath in the nose for about a two count and then just <sighs> long exhale yep. with like a two second hold at the end because that's where you tip in your autonomic nervous system from sympathetic, which is our fight and our flight, where our ears are in our shoulders, we're ready to either fight, <laughs> flee, or faint, yeah. <laughs> to whew, the rest and digest, which is our parasympathetic, and that's where the long exhale is good. So, you know, it helped me balance some of these stresses that were just kind of thrown into my life and figure out a way to overcome that. Yeah. And that's where breath work has been such a big thing to bring to my patients because to some extent I've been okay sharing some of my own story with people, especially if they're open to it or if I feel like that helps them on their journey. And, you know, as a provider, you always need to dance the line of, you know, what's personal, what's professional. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's where I've tried to bring people that breath work. <laughs> I do cold training like the Wim Hof method myself because yeah. I was in Minnesota, so I had plenty of snow to take advantage of. But yeah. Again, controlling your pain, controlling your anxieties, finding ways to do that yourself. If you yeah. give someone a tool to do that in a half an hour or an hour session, they're going to come back for more. They're going to want to find ways to advance their own wellness independently because not a lot of providers do that. No, not at all. Not at all. And that's a whole empowerment piece. Right on. Uh, I remember thinking about Wim Hof and I went back to New Jersey and there was a bunch of snow this past winter yeah. and I was up visiting my dad and for maybe 15 minutes I was out there barefoot walking in the snow and I remember him he's like Chris get back in here you're crazy he goes you're gonna get sick yeah. and I was like actually I'm strengthening my system <laughs> but um I've always found this guy Wim Hof incredible I saw the documentary didn't he climb up Mount Everest or in part shorts of it? and boots in shorts and boots yeah that's incredible it's insane and he's run a marathon above the arctic circle in shorts and boots and yeah. a marathon in the desert with no water yeah. and 26.2 miles Whoa. without drinking water in a desert 
It's Whoa. like, okay, what's this guy doing that, that we're not tapping into? And of course he's done it his whole life. And, um, but it's, it's just pretty incredible. Yeah, it's incredible because he is a testament to the capacity of our own system and our mm -hmm. own innate intelligence in mm -hmm. healing as well as resilience. Yeah. Right? And we just need to tap, tap, tap into it, right? And empower yeah. ourselves. I love what you said about it, resilience, where, you know, it's a word that gets thrown around. Oh, resilience, grit, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean? And I think that I like to talk about this thing that we're building here in America called the automatic life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's this automatic life of comfort, not ever having to go outside of our zone, going from our humidity controlled 72 degree home into a car that has been preheated or, you know, yeah. pre-warmed yeah. or cooled yeah. to the setting that we want it to. And we're never challenging our system to adapt. And so that's, again, our system, our brain, our muscles, I think they all adapt on this progressive overload or underload scale yeah. that is a spectrum and what everybody can handle and how far they can push it at any given time. That's, you know, to the individual where maybe having a provider or somebody to get you started on that journey is a great, a yeah. great way to do it. But one of my things is make yourself uncomfortable every day, whether it's emotionally, physically, spiritually, men mentally, whatever, challenge yourself a little bit every day. And there we will find growth. Yeah. I mean, how else are you going to grow? Right. You can't do it when you're stagnant. So, um, I mean, your bones hurt when they're growing, right? Yeah. Right? There's, there's, there's and your that pain and discomfort. Exactly. So, um, all right. So, people who are listening, what is a physical discomfort that they can experience? Go outside, work out. What, what, do, you, what do you think? I mean, yeah, any sort of exercise or movement, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're into lifting weights or doing yoga. The day afterwards, your body will be sore. Yeah. You know, I tell people if the soreness, you know, lasts for maybe 24 to 48 hours, that's normal. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that is called delayed onset muscle soreness. Yeah. When we push our body beyond the capacity that we're used to, we might feel that soreness. Wait for it to go away. You know what? Do it again. I bet you you won't get as sore. Yeah, it's you true. Know? And then do it again. And then do it again. And then by the fifth, fifth or sixth time doing it after a couple of weeks, you won't have any soreness anymore. Guess what you got to do now? Do it a little harder. Do yeah. it a little longer. Um, so any sort of movement practice, discomfort, try going outside without a jacket when you think it's a little cold. Oof, that seems brutal right? for me. I hate, I hate the cold, man. <laughs> and while you do it, breathe. Yeah. Keep those shoulders down by your, you yeah. know, away from your ears. Try to relax into that. Yeah. And like you said, when you were walking outside without your shoes on, actually... I'm improving my yeah, system right now. Knowing that it's doing something for you. It's funny because I moved into this new place and the gauge on the cold is yeah. the water temperature is so much colder than my old place. Oh, yeah. So I do do that every morning. I, I do alternating contrast hydrotherapy, hot and cold, hot and cold, mm -hmm. and I end in cold. Um, in the beginning, I literally would be holding my breath and like either holding my breath or yelling because it's so cold. Yeah. Um, but now I've actually worked into breathing right? Mm -hmm. Calming down and being like, all right, I'm grateful for this really cold ass water, yeah. but I'm going to breathe through it. And now at, at this point, I'm just like, all right, you know, I, now I just breathe normal because I feel the change. Mm -hmm. You, you build onto that. Right. And totally. it always blew me away. These people were jumping into ice baths because mm -hmm. I haven't done that yet. Yeah. You but should. I hear a lot about it from people close to me who've done it. They're like, oh, it's an experience. You know, <laughs> if you basically lose your breath, right? It gets so cold, right? Yeah, it's, it's a shock right away. I am um, in Minnesota. As soon as the ice would go out, I would go just wade out into the water and you could still see the ice out there and get down just, you know, about up to my throat and just yeah, sit and breathe. And it's funny. I went to one Wim Hof course in Brooklyn out in New York, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's funny what he says. He just said, love it. That pain, that's joy. Yeah. That's your body experiencing something new. Yeah. You know, let it feel it. Yeah, he's yeah. an eccentric man. Yeah, he's, he's pretty crazy, <laughs> but in the best of ways. So, so why are people jumping into these ice baths? Is it, is it because it's strengthening their system? Is that, like, that, is it a hormetic shock to the system or stress? And then they come out and everything's like... Yeah, it does a lot um, for your circulation. If you can kind of control what our body does when we experience cold, our vessels will constrict, right, to keep blood in the core and in the center. And when we breathe and keep ourselves in that parasympathetic state, we control the, what's the smooth muscle that kind of contracts and yep. relaxes on the vessels. We can control that and keep our 
extremities vasodilated, mm -hmm. right? You know, to an extent, and if you stay in it long enough, then somebody who's untrained would struggle to keep, you know, that vasodilation and keep their extremities warm long enough. So he says initially, if you go outside in the winter or if you sit in a cold bath for two to three minutes, that's plenty to start. Mm -hmm. um, it also does things to your pain centers because if we perceive cold, there's different systems of the body of the nervous mm -hmm. system that perceive cold. Mm -hmm. And once we get past 42 degrees Fahrenheit, it's actually perceived by the same nerves that perceive pain, mm -hmm. right? So when you get into an ice bath, you're basically telling your entire body, pain, 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 pain. Yeah, and it hurts. Right? And it yeah. does, and it stings, and it burns a little bit. But you know you're not harming your body. You're not causing lasting damage. Again, if you know how long you stay in, and if you yeah. have somebody with you to kind of take you through that process initially, or just try it for a minute right away. But when you can breathe and relax into that, then the next time you bump your shoulder or you have a painful experience, you know, those pain centers are like, ah, this is nothing. Uh, we just experience that all over the body. Right. So just like working out and building muscle, you're building your system enough yeah. to be able to have a better or more resilient experience with the outer world. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. Yeah. No, the the human capacity and potential is incredible. And I think that Wim Hof really highlights this for us. There was one thing you said when you were in the shower that you said, man, I'm grateful for this cold ass water. Yeah. And I think that practicing gratitude during those really tough times is huge. It helps you have more gratitude during easy times mm -hmm. or times that you want to complain about something. But when you're walking in the cold and it's just like, you know, I'm so grateful that I get to get to my destination and go into a warm home. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, I haven't eaten, I've fasted for this long, man, I'm so hungry. You know, I'm grateful for the benefit this is bringing my body and for the amazing food I have access to at the end of this fast. Yeah. It helps you to, when you can be grateful in those times, when you're cold, when you're in pain, when you're in a cold shower, whatever it may be, it's easier to practice gratitude elsewhere. Yeah, certainly, especially when you're in the thick of things, like, <laughs> totally. like you know, below whatever freezing cold ice bath. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what it does. It, you know, shifts our broadcasting frequency, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing more powerful to me than gratitude because mm -hmm. it's the quickest way to resubmit whatever you're broadcasting yeah. really fast, even in the shittiest of times. Yeah, and that's something for me and what kind of, you know, potentiated this move out to LA was my attitude. Yeah. You know, I was in a place in life where I, the setting I was working in, I don't want to say I wasn't happy, but it wasn't what I knew was going to fulfill me long term. Yeah. And there was so much I could learn for it. The people I worked with, they were great. I loved my coworkers. Um, but in a lot of aspects, they had a different energy of life than I was trying to put out. And they say that. <laughs> What you put out is what the universe is going to sling back to you or your vibe attracts your tribe, whatever mm -hmm. kind of cliche, mm -hmm. you know, personal development mantra you want to insert here. And so the more that I kind of dove in and, and put out this energy that, hey, this is what I want in life. These are the I started writing affirmations. I started writing down, you know, gratitudes in the mornings. I started just keeping a daily journal and picking out something that I could like, hey, I think this helps yeah. me learn about something today yeah. or, or whatever it may be inserting some sort of practice like that can then help you draw more out of yourself as yeah. far as where I want to learn to get where I want to go to because if your goal and your ideal destination doesn't match what you're doing now <laughs> I'm sorry but you might not get there yeah you know how you do one thing is how you do everything and then that's what the universe God the source whatever you believe in spiritually is going to bless into your life. Yeah. So I know you told me a little story about some of the things that you started telling yourself. And that was, you know, inspirational to me coming out here because I see so many successful people around me yeah. that I try to do everything I can not to compare. Right, right, right. <laughs> and not to say, hey, I need to be there now. Yeah, yeah. Because that's your not own the truth. reality. Your own truth. Yeah. Right. It's just a point of reference. Yeah. Right. And be like, oh, I see what they're doing. What's my reality now? What's my. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've always done that. I've always just seen people who I wanted to model myself after medically, spiritually, emotionally. And mm -hmm. then I'm like, all right, I got it. Now, what's my truth? 
you know, mm -hmm. with that knowledge, what's my truth, but never comparing because it's not going to go. You know, you are, you are an incredible chef. <laughs> People need to know that. Okay. And uh, I want, I, look, for so many of us, we don't even know how to start, right? Mm -hmm. We don't even know how to cook, especially yeah. a lot of us dudes out there, right? You're a big exception. So I want maybe for you to talk about the importance or like, what can we do? How can we hack in the kitchen? What are some yeah. just, just things that we can add on for us to start eating healthier? Yeah, so I mean, that's something that coming out here, I really would love to bring to people more yeah. because that's the thing. A lot of it's like, man, I want to eat healthy. I even have the access to the food and materials and then I get into the kitchen and I'm like, uh, yeah. what do I do here? Yeah. So something that I started doing when I got into this you know, meal prep realm where I wanted to prep the meals for the week. Cause I think that's one of the, if you've heard of, uh, Tim Ferriss's the four hour chef, mm -hmm. you know, I think reading through his book, it makes it so digestible as to how you can make really great meals for the whole week in a short amount of time. And I think that's what everyone's looking for. Cause they're like, Oh, it's so much easier to go pick up a salad from sweet green or do something where you can yeah. still get healthy options, but it might be a little bit heavier on the wallet. Right. And I feel like there's something that's just fulfilling about preparing food for yourself and or others and sharing that with your body and yeah. with the people around you. Yeah, it's intention, right? The energy. Behind totally. It. So um, I would say find those few recipes that you can prepare in bulk. I love roasting vegetables. Okay. If you have any doubts about yourself, set the oven to 425, chop up some potatoes, beets, radishes, broccoli, cauliflower, whatever. I know you're big on cruciferous vegetables. I love, love them. I've got like my cruciferous vegetable drawer in my fridge at yeah. all times now. Cool. And set those in the oven for, you know, 20 minutes usually with a little oil on it. And then you'll have roasted vegetables for about four or five days. Perfect. Right. And that's like a very easy thing that once you do, you take them out, you taste them, you can season them with whatever you want as you're drizzling the olive oil, season, salt, pepper, yeah. you know, cayenne, whatever you want on them. So, I would love to start doing that more for people because, again, it's the independence bit. Right. And for the people who can't order their food in or order healthy food options or, you know, don't have that in their budget, being able to prep like that during the week and take two hours on a Sunday to box up <laughs> five lunches and five dinners, yeah. you know, then that saves so much time and headache throughout the week as to, how can I eat healthy and also prevent some of those, oh, I got fast food three times this week. Yeah. Or because I've been there. It's easy to go through the drive through. It's easy to, quote unquote, fall off the wagon, which is also you know, a saying I don't like because I also think we need to be able to forgive ourselves yeah. in a lot of aspects yeah. where it's easy for us to label good and bad foods. Mm -hmm. and it's easy for us to say, OK, ice cream's bad you know what? I freaking love ice cream. Right, right. I see right? what you're saying. <laughs> and I'm going to allow myself, everyone, if I'm on a birthday party yeah. and they're having cake and ice cream, yep. heck yeah, give me a slice of cake and a little scoop of ice cream. Yeah. I'm not going to feel bad about that. Yeah. Right? I know it's not the most ideal thing to put in my body. However, I'm not going to let myself go back and have three pieces of cake and a half, you know, pint, sure. or a pint of ice cream. Sure, opening the floodgates and, you know. And then the next day it's like, oh, I just had cake and ice cream yesterday. Yeah. You know, maybe I can have pizza and a, and a smoothie yeah. or a shake Opening today. Yeah, opening the floodgates, yeah. Right? And then you kind of tumble into this thing where before you know it, like, man, how do I get back to that good behavior that I had created? Right. So almost allowing or planning in those, quote, what we've labeled as bad behaviors to say, I'm going to allow my body and brain to experience this. Use it as a mindful exercise. What What is my body feeling after I had that ice cream? What does my body feel after I had that pizza? Right. I know that after I have certain foods, I have different presentations in my body now. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of aspects, it pushes me away from wanting to do that more mm -hmm. and just say, you know what? That tasted amazing. I got to experience birthday to the fullest with yeah. my aunt or my brother or yeah. whoever it was. Yeah. Um, next time I'll have even a smaller piece. Yeah, really important to be mindful about how food's making you feel. It's a lot totally. of people are like, they don't even know until they do a food journal and then they do the food journals. They're like, well, now that I realize every time I eat broccoli, it's, my stomach is just killing me. You yeah. know, maybe we need to change the way you eat broccoli or how much of it you eat. Um, so, all right, roasted vegetables in the fridge, that can last them five days or so, right? They, they, yeah. You can just pick at it, add it in there. Um, any other tips? Like, Because sometimes I think, especially for me, time-wise, sometimes it feels overwhelming. I'll do a ton of stuff, come home, and I'm like, 
oh, I have like an hour only to mm -hmm. not only cook, but finish up some charts or finish up all these emails. Like, what are some things that maybe, aside from the roasting vegetables, that you could come into mind that we can maybe start doing? Yeah, man, you're testing me here. Um, I'd say smoothies are huge. Okay. I love prepping and then storing smoothies. Okay. I mean, you can fill a Ninja blender with all sorts of good things. I love making sure I get some kale or something in there, get some good fats, like some avocado, um, some ground like chia or flax powder, although it's not the greatest source of omegas. I mean, mm -hmm. you still you get them get, in there. You might yeah. get some in there. Um, finding a good base like an almond milk or even water. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen his reviews on almond milk and one that's coming out on oat milk. The maybe. oat milk is coming out too, so we'll see. Right yeah. on. So, um, you know, add your good base in there. And so you can make these smoothies that in one little cup has just about all your micronutrients for the day. Mm -hmm. um, you can eat it, drink it quickly while you're looking at some charts. And that's what I do for my breakfast prep when I'm, when I'm working. I'll make a whole blender of smoothies, portion it out into five, you know, store four or store all five of them and just take one out and put it in the fridge the night before. Yeah. And then I grab it in the morning, go to work. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. See, because things like this, this convenient approach is mm -hmm. easy for people who are busy, who are listening, right, and running mm -hmm. around. Um, because not everyone has the real passion for cooking the way you may. Yeah. Right. Um, but these easy hacks are really good. And I oh, started yeah. to, I mean, I do smoothies all the time. Yeah. So, and, and they're helpful because they're quick, pretty quick, but mm -hmm. you have a ton of micronutrients, a variety of colors. Boom. That's how you get your day started. You're feeling good. Yeah. And then having coming home and having access to greens or root vegetables are really nice too. Cause you throw mm -hmm. it in there, then your cooking time's cut in half. Yeah. And that's another thing I like doing for coming home. Um, and, you know, not everyone likes salads. And that's another big barrier. Like you said, you have people food journal. One of the biggest things that I start talking about these food items and people are like, oh, I don't like salads. Mm -hmm. I really don't like anything green. I really don't. And so it's like, how do we get over that barrier? Yeah. And, you know, I'd love to hear what you're, what you do with different people who just have food barriers as like, oh, I just don't like that. Right. And in reality, I, th I think a lot of times it's because our palate, our mind has never tasted it, has never had it in mm -hmm. us and has never then felt what it makes our body feel like. Yeah. And if you start introducing those things, smoothies are a great way to introduce different foods because mm -hmm. you don't have to chew them yourself yeah, that's true. and you can cover it up with a handful of blueberries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I'm big on salads for those that really enjoy salads. Cause you can, again, on a Sunday, chop up a lot of things, put your base, which can be, you know, spinach and then finely chopped kale cause chick kale can get a little tough to chew at sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then whatever other vegetables you like. It's so like you said, some root vegetables I love, like thinly slicing a bunch of radishes and tossing them in there, some carrots, yeah. tossing them in there. You know, you could chop up some peppers and put them on top, and there's your salad base. Maybe spritz like a little bit of lime juice and a tiny bit of olive oil in it just to get it wet, and that'll even keep for a good three days in the fridge. Yeah. And you come home, chop up an avocado on it quick. Yeah. You know, for people who are you know, aren't vegetarian, vegan, you could throw in an egg, throw something like that on top. Like salmon or something. Some nuts, yeah. some salmon. So I think like utilizing, I know you mentioned sweet green before, like their salads are delicious, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe utilizing and understanding that you can make that at home too. Yeah. Um, and not much different. Just look at their formula. Look at the they ingredients. Have, yeah, look at the ingredients. <laughs> so totally. because, and then having a good dressing. And now at this point, there's so many healthy mm. brands. Um, I know Primal Kitchen has some really good uh, yeah. formulas for salad dressing, you know, you put that, you mix it up, you can make a delicious salad. Some people have issues with the raw food. Mm -hmm. So I always say, look, you know, cook some stuff in the salad, right? Mm -hmm. Put a little bit of raw and cook, cook some other things. Um, and that might be helpful too. So one of yeah. my favorites thing is you take the first thing I talked about, those roasted vegetables, heat them up, plop them on top of the salad that you just made. Mm -hmm. There you go. Then you have kind of a, a cooked and a raw yeah. contrast. And then the cooked veggies almost 
dress the salad as well. Mm. So you can then, if you don't have a good healthy dressy option or dressing option, there you yeah, go. Yeah, and they're easy to make at home. And I haven't eaten all day, so I'm dying right now talking about this. <laughs> I'm on a fast yeah, right now, yeah, too. Yeah, you're fasting, so. too. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you don't see us on YouTube, we're both dying right now. Our yeah. faces are melting off because <laughs> we're so hungry. Um, cool, man. So, so you're here in L.A., what are your plans now? Are you going to do home visits? Are you working in a hospital or, or you know, like let's, yeah. what are your plans? So I'm just over a year out of school. I graduated May of 2018, you know, worked in rural Minnesota, got some great hospital, long-term care, outpatient experience there, outpatient in a hospital. And I actually did uh, sign to start a job in an outpatient, more orthopedic and sports type setting great mission, great company. I'm very excited to work there to continue to get good PT mentorship and to be a part of that community and more so to grow my knowledge as a PT yep. in that sense. Yep. Um, and then I would love, my plan is to start building a clientele on my own where I work with people on mindset, meals, and movement. Okay. Right? Those are going to be my three areas, your physical health, nutritional health, and your human health. And in a lot of aspects, it starts with mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, exactly how this this tumbles out, I think I'm going to use some of my first clients as <laughs> as the, the guinea pigs. And I would come into somebody's home, cook a meal, box up the leftovers for them, and we would chat mm -hmm. about health, about what they're doing in the areas of movement and meals right now. And then during the whole talk, you sprinkle in the bits about mindset, mm -hmm. about starting up here. I, have, I had some amazing PT mentors that were some of the first people I observed, and I just talked to them about everyone's so happy when they leave your clinic. Everyone's so happy when they come into your clinic. You know, I, it's just like, and they're like, dude, it's not about what we do. It's about how we make someone feel right. when they leave or when they think about coming to see us. Mm -hmm. And so if you can make someone feel comfortable, if you can make somebody know that you're there with them in their space trying to understand what's going on in their lives, that's the first step as a provider to busting people's barriers down, yeah. to opening them up to maybe a slightly different way of doing things. And what I've always said is you need to start here and you need to start here. Yeah. And for those that aren't watching this, I'm pointing to my yeah. head, yeah. between my ears and in my heart. Yeah. And once I know what's going on in my patient's mind and in their heart, then we address the physical stuff. Then we address the meals a little bit easier yeah. because we've kind of prepped them for change. Right, because there's going to be a lot of resistance for many people unless they mm -hmm. open their mind and their heart. This you, you you see how like conventionally we skip like three steps, yeah. right? And we just go straight to the physical and we go, oh, well, here, take this and go home. Yeah, um, that's not medicine. It's not healing. It's not health. But um, I think that's an awesome mission. Um, so you are you going to roll this out this year? What if people in LA want you to work with you? How are they going to find you? So I'm right now on Instagram. I'm trying to build a presence there and put out more consistent material again in just basic movement practices, things you can do for mindset, gratitude. Um, Fridays are my meal days. So I'm going to mm -hmm. try to put out fuel Fridays, get okay. you an, an easy idea on a meal that you could make. And yeah, right now, if you had any interest in chatting with me, learning tips, or wanted to schedule a session, you could DM me through Instagram. I'm starting to put together my business right now, so I'd okay. love to start seeing people whenever, but hopefully doing a more formal rollout in the next month. And what's the Instagram name you're here? It's so it's Dr. Dom DPT. It's D-R Dom DPT. So I got you before you blew up, so this is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. It would have been a lot harder to get you on the show. I got before you before I blew you blew up. up. Like it's like it's inevitable, right? right? Oh, duh. Come on. We're talking about intention, <laughs> gratitude, unfolding. Well, no, I know. And, I just know? appreciate that you're speaking into my truth. Speaking your existence already. <laughs> um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out Dom on Instagram. He's going to be uh, around LA doing amazing things. Someone I'm completely behind. I think he's doing incredible work. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, just DM him. You're available, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not working now, so I have more free time right now, but um, I'll make time for people that want to make the time for themselves. I love that model. Thank you for coming on, man. Thank you. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, viewers, listeners, thank you for tuning in. That was an amazing interview. I hope you're all empowered. I hope you learned some stuff. I hope this whole show taught you how to be more empowered. Be careful with your oat milks. You know the lymphatic system. Move, eat better, meal prep, pain, breathing, mindfulness. 
that was a show and a half. I'll see you next week. <laughs>